Hi guys, so today I'm here with Bart Kay. He is a professor of exercise physiology. Um, well, previous professor, he's done a great deal of work in the academic community. He's got um, years and years of experience, probably more experienced than my age in some regard. Um, I hope, hoping that uh, Yali Ted will join today as well. So I'm not going to bother introducing him anymore. He's very popular and he's a key figure in our our community, so I'm glad to have one today. Yes, Yellow Ted is an absolute key member of our community. You're, you're quite right. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very good to have Ted with us. And uh, in fact, uh, Ted, is there anything you'd like to say? Bollocks! Oh, God, he can't behave for a second, can he? <laughs> He's incredible. Yeah. Mm. Right. Makes my day every time. Um, so the reason I wanted to bring you on today was to go over the whole exercise physiology stuff. Okay. Um, so my, this is my first question. We kind of left off on the last video um, talking about different methodologies and how specific training needs to be. Yeah. So it is, why do people feel we need to have an aerobic base for exercise? And why is that concept wrong? Right. Okay, so the idea of an aerobic base comes from the false idea that as your exercise intensity increases up towards your maximum volitional exhaustive exercise level, that one of the things that leads you to an inability to continue is a lack of oxygen. Like... They say, oh, there's such a thing as the anaerobic threshold where you suddenly, you know, aren't, you don't suddenly have enough oxygen. Um, and they talk about a lactate threshold, which they say, well, that you start developing lactic acid in your muscles because of a lack of oxygen. And that's how the whole thing is, is pinned together. And also, when you do a bunch of aerobic fitness and you get this aerobic base behind you, the intensity of exercise at which the so-called anaerobic threshold and the so-called lactate thresholds occur moves to the right, i.e. to a higher exercise intensity. So that would seem to back up this idea that a lack of oxygen or a lack of ability to use oxygen is a problem during exercise. Why is it wrong? Okay, it's wrong because human anaerobic exercise capacity is precisely none at all. There is no such thing as anaerobic exercise in human physiological terms whatsoever. Um, the understanding of muscle energetics, the way that a muscle cell is constructed, is vital to, to grasp this concept, I guess. And it goes like this. In your muscle... Energy is produced, if you like, via the oxidation of fats and carbohydrates, mostly, and the mitochondria do that. The mitochondria don't spend energy, they make it. Energy is spent outside the mitochondria, in the cell at large, but not within the mitochondria. So the, the, the machinery in a muscle cell that, that causes the muscle cell to contract, the sliding filaments, all of that, that machinery is the stuff that spins the energy that was made by the mitochondria. Okay. All of that stuff, that sliding filament stuff, the stuff that actually makes the muscle mechanically do what muscles do, contract and apply force to bones, all of that is done without oxygen. There is no route for oxygen to play any role in that whatsoever. The amount of, and it's glycogen, by the way, which is glucose starch, which is used as the fuel source to fire that muscle contraction on the sliding filaments. The amount of glycogen that's stored in a muscle fiber, depending on the muscle fiber morphology and which particular muscle of the body it is, etc. On average, though, the amount of glycogen stored in a muscle fiber is enough to cause that muscle fiber to twitch, to contract and relax one or two times total. 
And if the mitochondria weren't producing energy, if that suddenly, if you suddenly magically could dip into a cell and grab the mitochondria and pull them out of there, or magically wave your wand and make them disappear, that muscle would twitch once or twice, and that's it, done. No more fuel in that muscle cell. It will not twitch again, or if it's in the middle of a twitch and it runs out of fuel, it will be locked in that aspect. And basically, then what happens very soon after that is that cell will die. That muscle cell will definitely die. And so it's not like you have anaerobic system and several anaerobic systems like you're taught in exercise physiology courses. They'll teach you you've got an aerobic system, that's oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, and you've got two anaerobic systems, that's glycogenolysis and um, the PCR system. And depending on exercise intensity, that, that will tell you which system is the one that takes the brunt of the exercise provision. Well, that's false, is what I'm telling you. All muscle contractions require all three systems. Here's how they work. Mitochondria produce ATP. But mitochondria do not exude ATP into the cell cytosol. The ATP made by a mitochondria is split by that mitochondria into ADP plus PI, ready for a new resynthesis inside that mitochondria. And at the same time, on the other side of the membrane, it's like two cogs in a gearbox. That energy that the mitochondria is producing is used to put a creatine molecule onto a phosphocreatine molecule. Bam! Now we've got phosphocreatine. And that phosphocreatine is free-floating in the cell fluid, and it exudes out to the sliding filaments... And that energy is then used to resynthesize muscle glycogen in between muscle contractions from incoming blood glucose. They are gears in a gearbox. They are all in contact with each other, translating the energy from the mitochondria, where it's generated, to the muscle fibers where it's used. Take any one of those gears out of play, instantaneously, magically somehow, the whole system breaks down, the muscle cell will not work at all. All fitness in muscle fiber contractions is specific to intensity. No amount of aerobic training will prepare you to do heavy weightlifting. No amount of heavy weightlifting will prepare you to do a lot of aerobic work either. So the idea that you need an aerobic base and everything is built on that absolute nonsense rubbish it just shows a complete misunderstanding of exercise physiology sorry very long answer but very very good question there you go yeah um i see a lot of people doing like 20 minutes of cardio then they'll do an hour of weights and another 20 minutes of cardio and it's like just pick a goal and stick to it and use use the fibers that you're trying to use to produce the outcome you're trying to create that's it um, exactly I mean, if you go and ask those people doing the cardio, why are you doing that? Most of them won't be able to give you a sensible answer other than, oh, that's what my trainer told me to do. Or they'll say warm up, but their warm up is them dripping with sweat. Yeah. On the trip. yeah. And why do you need to warm up for 20 minutes? Mm. You know, if it takes yeah. 20 minutes, yeah. it's probably not really a warm up. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, outside of training specificity. Mm hmm. Is that right? Specificity. Yes, that's it. Yep. What should people focus on when planning a resistance training program? Um, for me, the big ones are safety, which are progressive overload to a sensible level based on your experience as a lifter and your expertise as a lifter and what um, experience training you might or might not have available to you. Form doing the exercise correctly. And it's more important to do it correctly than it is to lift more weight doing it incorrectly. I see a lot of guys in the gym doing, you know, bicep curls like this sort of thing and throwing their back around and backwards and forwards and grunting like a pig. Um, no, your breath should be under control. Your form should be under control. You shouldn't be swaying at the hips. It should all come from your biceps. You know, everything should be rock solid. 
for example. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd far sooner see you lift a weight correctly than lift a bigger weight and do it incorrectly because you're only going to hurt yourself at some point. So safety, big one. Um, progressive overload in your program such that you always keep your intensity at the right level and your volume at the right level. So as soon as you can easily do 10 reps, if you let's say you're doing a hypertrophy training program, you want to build muscle mass, and you're doing whatever it is, let's say you're doing a deadlift, and the weight that you've been struggling to get eight reps out, suddenly you're doing 10 and it's no real trouble, then you up your weight by 10%. And maybe you'll only get six or seven out, that's okay, build yourself back up to eight, but as soon as you get to nine and 10 on that, you need to up that weight again. I see a lot of people getting to a certain point where it gets um, easier and they could have done 10, but they stop at 8 because you're supposed to stop at 8. Well, you're not progressing. And then they say, well, I'm not growing. And it's because you're not pushing yourself to the right level. You're not, you're not asking your body to adjust to a new, a new level of absolute weight in line with trying to get your muscle hypertrophy going sort of thing. Uh, you need to keep the relative intensity the same, which means the absolute weight that you're lifting is going to go up quite rapidly at first when you first start lifting, and then it will level off quite a bit to a point where when you become really quite a good, quite an experienced lifter, you'll get very little increases in your weights over months. And then you have to start throwing in big negatives or drop sets or pyramiding or changing the either the order or the or the exercises you've got in your program or changing your split around in some way to get your body guessing again. Um, but for most people who are just starting out, you're going to get lots of strength increases very, very rapidly up front. So be prepared to actually go with that. Good to get together with a trainer every four weeks, I'd say, in the first three or four months. And just make sure you're you're on top of it. Yeah, yeah that outlines it really well. So um, when I'm coaching people, I get them to send me videos of them doing the exercise, and it's all good them saying to me on their plan, "Oh, I've done ten reps, eight reps, twelve reps, whatever, with fifty kilos." Mm -hmm. But how did you lift that fifty kilos? Mm. Were you struggling, or was it no struggle at all? So yeah, again, I need to use that sort of data to feedback myself and think, okay. This yeah. person's not trying hard enough. So mm. it's, a, it's a great point you made about as well about the um, the issue that people don't – people use all these intensifier techniques, but they're not at a point in their training experience and level that they need to use it. Mm. Um, so like you said, I'd completely agree to nail the progressive overload aspect of it. Um, you know, get your eight repetitions in and just learn to contract your muscles. That's – um, ultimately what a lot of people struggle to do yeah so yeah um my next question is a bit nuanced so okay. is there an argument to be had for utilizing a less intense sub maximal resistance training routine mm -hmm. and if so what might it be yeah um on a case-by-case -case basis you might have someone who is returning from injury and needs to be, you need to be a bit careful with that injury, but perhaps. Um, that's one example I could think of. Um, you might have someone who's had cardiac issues or blood pressure issues, in which case you would be modifying certain things as well. Like in the case of that, you would you would not have them doing any overhead lifting whatsoever. Um, and you probably wouldn't have them even benching, frankly. I wouldn't actually have people benching anyway, unless they are power lifters, personally, because I think bench press with a barbell, I mean, with a barbell, I think that's one of the stupidest exercises you could do. I think that's a real problem. Um, I think you should do it. Two dumbbells, never a barbell for bench press. And yes, you will move less absolute weight that way, but I don't care. It will not affect your 
pectoral development, if you do it correctly, what it will do is save your shoulders from mm. from the the wrecking they will otherwise get. If you continue to, to do bench press with a barbell, at some point you will get a shoulder injury. Um, show me any decent powerlifter who's been a powerlifter for any number of years that's never had a shoulder injury. It, it's it's craziness. Um, so that's another example of what you're talking about. It's because if you're if you're doing if you're lifting with two dumbbells on a bench press rather than with a barbell, you are absolutely going to be able to lift less absolute weight. But I'll tell you what, you're stabilizing much more. You're actually activating more of the fibers and more of the synergist muscle groups. Absolutely. And as such, you know, you could argue that it's not really even less intense. It is in terms of the absolute weight, though. So there's just two two or three examples just quickly off the top of my head. Injury, cardiac or blood pressure issues, and bench press for everybody, except for powerlifters who have to train with a bar because that's how they compete. And in fact, what I say to powerlifters is you might want to consider giving that away because it's not a sensible sport for that very reason. Mm. Yeah. yeah. In the yeah. same way that people um, that come to me that, that are ultra marathoners or whatever, or ultra endurance athletes say to me, how should I train for that? I say, well, I could tell you. And absolutely, you want to pay me the money, I will tell you how to train for that. But also it would be irresponsible for me not to say to you, you should give away ultra endurance sport. It's bad for you. Okay. That's exactly why I didn't, on, well, I didn't add that aspect of um, nuance to when I was talking about the Randall cycle in an earlier video. Right. Um, I didn't want to promote it in that sort of way. So a lot of my stuff is on weight training. Excellent. I'm um, just getting strong. That's that's basically it. But yeah, I haven't looked I at your Randall cycle video yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I'm looking forward to your scrutiny. I shall send you a grade. Yeah, <laughs> no. do it. Oh, Harry so far approves. So that's one out of two. Oh, well, good. Good. Um, so next question is around recovery. So we kind of covered how muscles work, mm -hmm. um, training. So how would someone know when they're training beyond their recovery capability if that is such a thing? Right. In terms of weight training, hypertrophy training, strength training, that kind of thing, in general, on average, some people are better than others in this regard. Some people get away with more than others, whatever. There is individual difference. But as a general rule of thumb, I suggest to most people, and not for people like yourself, John, because obviously this isn't going to work for you at your level and your degree of development, etc. But for the average Joe who just wants to put some muscle mass on from baseline, I'm going to suggest that that person does a whole body split three times a week and no more and never train on consecutive days. Once you get to Jonathan's level, sure, you might be doing an upper body, lower body split. You might be doing a push-pull split. You might be doing three or four splits by the time you're his size experience and you've lifted as much as he has. But until then... No, you're doing a whole body split, top to tail, three times a week, and that's made up of probably 10 or 12 exercises that you will complete within 45 minutes, and that includes the shower, all right? And then you're out of there, and you're resting for the next day, and you're recuperating, and you're taking care of your nutrition in the way that you should, and you're hitting the gym again two days later, you should feel 80, 90% recovered on that second day when you hit the gym. Or up to 100 if you, if you do get to 100. But certainly if you get to the gym two days after your last training session and you still feel like you know, you're 65% right, then you actually ought not to be training that day. It's that because that means you're just going to be dragging your body down. The whole thing with, with getting fitter is that it's a response to the injury of the training. The training itself is a mild form of muscle injury. 
That's why the muscle gets bigger, so that it's stronger, more robust, less likely to be damaged in the same way that you've just damaged it in your last training session. So you hit the muscle, you damage it, it gets sore, it gets inflamed. It says, rest me, rest me, you've damaged me, I need to repair and heal. You need to listen to that and wait till your body is the vast majority back to its best before you hit it again. Otherwise, you're just imposing injury on injury, and that just drags you down over weeks and months. Makes you excessively tired, probably makes you want to eat too much, and will drag your strength down, your endurance, your strength endurance as well down. It will drag everything down. And actually, you'll end up not growing. You'll end up depressed and pissed off with the whole idea. And then what are you going to do? You're going to sit on the couch and, and eat fries or what? I don't know. You'll just give up, aren't you? So give your body a chance to recover before you hit it again. You, you never, ever, ever get fitter lifting weights in the gym. You only ever get fitter when you're resting and recovering from the damage you did to yourself in the gym. More damage in the gym doesn't mean fitter. It means you're not allowing your body to repair. I hope I've been clear on that. Yeah, completely. You brought up some really good points as well, um, especially about how frequently you should train. So myself as an advanced lifter, um, I'm finding... When I first started training, I could train six, seven days a week. Mm. But at that point in time, I was not using maximum intensity. Therefore, my results could have been accelerated to some extent. Mm. The other issue I had was as I learned how to use intensity to my to my benefit, I can't train as often as that anymore. It's somewhere between four and five sessions a week. All right. Cool. So that's, that's where I'm falling at the moment. Um, so people watching this, like Bart says, you know, Give your body time to recover. It's, it's underrated and misunderstood, I think. Brilliant. And how many splits have, are you doing? I'm doing a push-pull leg split. Right. So you've got it's three splits, thing. basically, or two splits, push-pull, top and bottom. Um, push-pull yeah. and leg. Right, so three splits. Three splits, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm doing that on a rotation. And the other thing I notice as well with people training is that they – they seem to think they need to do a two-on, one-off or a one-on, one-off, you know, all that sort of thing. Mm. But um, I think you should almost listen to your body in a way. So, mm. I mean, I'm finding if I do more than two sessions in a row, my third session will be greatly impacted. Yeah. Um, it just goes to show you that there's a recovery aspect you need to do and manage within your own training yep. kind of standard. You bet. Yeah. Mm. So the next question is on the idea of central nervous system buildup. Mm -hmm. So it could be a bit of a false concept in some ways, but maybe a misunderstanding. Um, is there a possibility that under recovery of the central nervous system, when pushing that hard regularly, is going to be negatively impactful? Yeah, I think that is a real thing, and I think it is a very real risk for people who overtrain. Remember when I said in an answer to a question a few minutes ago that when you first start lifting as a novice lifter your strength goes up really quickly what actually is underpinning that strength improvement at the very beginning is that there's nothing metabolically any different about your muscles they're not any bigger they're not any stronger there's nothing going on with the way they're biomechanically functioning or metabolically functioning. There's been no change in enzymes or anything yet. But within the first few weeks, despite no physical change in the muscle fibers, you've got stronger. Your maximum strength has gone up. And it's because you've learned how to send the messages from your brain to your muscle fibers more effectively to get them to contract more strongly, more forcibly. So that's relevant in that if you overtrain, whether you're new or whether you're an experienced lifter, what I'm suggesting there is, is a lot of information and a lot of motor programming that your brain has to do and your nerves are using often as much energy to send the messages to your muscles as your muscles are using reacting to those messages. A lot of people don't understand that. They think all the energy is being spent by the muscles 
and the messages that fire the muscles are just magically getting there without a metabolic cost somehow? No. Every time a message goes through a nerve line, and there are millions of nerve lines between your brain and your muscles, every time a message goes through one of those nerve lines, it drains that whole line of its resting, what they call membrane potential. Um, and that's made up by having a whole bunch of ions at different concentrations across that membrane. And when you fire off a message through that line, it empties that line out, it drains it empty, and you've got to recharge the thing before it can be used again. And all of that takes energy because you've got to pump all these ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, etc., against their concentration gradients. You've got to actually physically pump these things to set up these resting levels of these ions so that that nerve fibre will react again to another message from the brain. And then, of course, upstream of that, the brain has to do the same thing to get those neurons ready to start sending those messages down those lines. So it's like brain, lots of energy, nervous system, lots of energy, muscles, lots of energy. It's not just your muscles. So your nerves absolutely do need time to recover from being really stressed. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a fallacy at all. I think it's a very real thing. And... One of the first things that will go if you overtrain when you're lifting is your strength will go. You might have noticed this yourself when you may have overtrained for a few weeks at a time, maybe before a competition or something. And while ever you're you're getting peaking ready for the competition, etc., and maybe you're doing a cut because you want to be lean as, as hell and your strength goes down just before the comp, you think, oh, it's because I've changed my diet. It might be, but there may well also be a neural component there. You might be you might be fried because right before the comp, you're going to lift your intensity and change your diet. So it's hard to say which one it was, but I'm betting it's both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd agree, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say my creatinine, uh, was it keep kinase was, but that was um, through the roof. Right. Yeah. A few weeks out. So, yeah, that's there's two aspects to recovery in that sort of way and you're completely right um the idea that we can just recover our muscles is not going to be enough there's also the like the neural firing kind of aspect of it as well yeah so the next question is specific towards um muscular hypertrophy yeah so you answered this in a recent interview before but i have it's not an issue but i kind of misunderstand what what is meant okay. so you've got yourself that recommends around one gram per centimeter of height of protein mm -hmm. as the ex absolute maximum sure and you've got harry um harry sopanos there's a yeah. yeah he recommends up to four grams per kilogram of body weight yeah so you've got two vastly different ideas um I think his is based on how to tribes people and yours is based on some anecdotes, some science, some, you know, just experience general. Yeah. Yeah. So where would you how would you push your argument for the one gram per centimeter? It seems to me, and I'm not saying Harry is wrong, and he might well be correct for certain purposes at certain times, that it might well be useful to have vastly more protein coming in than would than you would maybe do all the time, for example. But it seems to me that there is a maximum capacity of the human body to absorb and use amino acids and to incorporate them into growing muscle fibers or to replace component, protein components of the body as they wear out and all that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, John, your ability to absorb and use protein, is the an absolute amount of protein even, is going to be more than mine, right? You're taller than me. You're a lot more muscular. I wouldn't be surprised if you weigh twice what I do, frankly. Um, so you're going to be able to absorb more protein. But what we normally talk about with the protein is uh, as a function of something like either your ideal lean mass or your height or something like that. So I've got two figures that I normally use. 
for your average Joe Blow who's just getting started in hypertrophy, who isn't really particularly muscled yet, or for generalized people who are not trying to gain muscle mass, I would say to those people 1.75 grams of protein in total per kilogram of ideal lean body mass is probably a good sort of a number. For lifters like yourself, I say generally, oh, you don't really want to go much over one gram per centimeter in height. And the reason for that is because even as a quite muscled person, you are not going to be able to absorb a huge amount of protein, more than someone like myself, absolutely, but still not a huge amount. And any excess protein that's still left over after that, because you're thinking, oh, protein's great, I can eat as much protein as I like. No, because it's, it's gluconeogenic. So you might as well just eat sugar beyond a certain point. So I think that absolutely up to four grams of protein immediately following or during an illness of a particular kind might be handy. Maybe it's at a time when there's very little fat available during a year, if you're one of the heads or whatever, potentially. But I wouldn't necessarily say that I'd be hugely thrilled with someone taking in four grams per kilogram every day as a standard. I think that's too much, personally. Yeah, um, that, that explains it very well. So when you read these articles online, they'll say, this is what, how many grams you should have per pound per kilo, but it doesn't really elaborate like that. So I'm glad mm. you went over that. Mm. Um, as someone who has pushed the envelope with protein intake up to a 1.550 grams, so the time that would be five grams per kilogram, so it's even more than what Harry would suggest. Mm. Um, I can say your digestive rate is, is slower. Yeah. Um, therefore, the way you feel isn't quite as good. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I didn't notice that I retained muscle mass any better than I would on, say, 250, 200 grams of protein. Yeah. Um, so there's that as well. And like you said, the idea that you can overeat it and not get a fat, in essence. Um, Sorry. It's, it's, you know, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah, that's not going to work. Your body has developed fantastic strategies to take the best advantage for your survival from the available resource that you give it. If you eat too much sugar, it will be stored as fat. If you eat too much fat, it will be stored as fat. If you eat too much protein, that protein will be turned into sugar first, and then that sugar will be turned into fat. Simple as that. Hey, that rhymes. I'm a poet. And I didn't know it. Yeah. What did you think of my little uh, poem there, Ted? Bollocks! Oh, God. I don't know why I ask. I really don't. He's hopeless. Oh, I'm sure he'll come up with some other terms in maybe years to come. Maybe. So, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so I've got one more question before I wrap this up. And it is... A- Again, touching on what we went over last time, which is the high fat thing. Yeah. So a lot of people that watch my videos ask about high fat intake, you know, 80% of your effective energy. Mm. Um, so you mentioned last time that some people might have a overactive gluconogenic pathway. Mm-hmm. So what is, what is that concept and how would it apply to people? Um, if someone has an overactive gluconeogenic, gluconeogenic pathway, that means that they would be more likely to produce uh, glucose from some of the gluconeogenic precursors, such as lactate, um, maybe some of the gluconeogenic amino acids from protein, as we've just been talking about when you eat too much protein, but also glycerol backbones from triacylglyceride molecules, fat molecules, basically. So if you're consuming hugely too much protein and not enough, sorry, hugely too much fat and not enough protein, then 
you will be breaking down more triacylglycerol molecules and there'll be more glycerol backbones left over and they will then push back on the gluconeogenic pathway and then those will be formed into sugar, you know, so that, that's kind of how that can impact. Um, again, it's, it's when you've got a system that's, got, that's so complex and has so many positive and negative feedback looping systems that, that feed back on itself, um, it's, it's one of those things that can go a lot of different ways in an individual person at any given time on the basis of the balance of everything that that person is, is going through in terms of their training, their sleep, their stress levels, endocrine functioning, hormonal functioning, time of year, age and stage, all of those things. Um, and it can be near, near impossible to predict. One of the best things that you can do, if you have the kit for it and you have the capacity for it, is just to keep an eye on your, on your blood glucose, your, your fasting blood glucose, and also to keep an eye on your A1C. Or your, or your HbA1c, it's sometimes called. There you go. There's an example of a glucose meter there. Is that one a glucose or a glucose A1c as well? Um, just glucose. Right. So you can get you can get dual meters as well for glucose and, and for, for A1c, I think. Uh, you can get also meters that measure ketones as well. I wouldn't bother, frankly. Don't bother testing your ketones. It's a complete waste of time. Um the main thing is is to keep an eye on what your blood sugar is doing. If your blood sugar is drifting up and your protein is quite significant in your diet, then I would pull your protein back relative to your fat and you'll hit a sweet spot. If your protein's very low and your fat's very high and your A1C is drifting up or your resting is drifting up, bring your protein up and bring your fat down. There is a sweet spot. It's, it's one of those graphs for both protein and fat. Um, and of course it goes without saying that your dietary intake of carbohydrates ought to be none. Whether you're a lifter or not, whether you're an athlete or not, as close to zero as you can possibly attain and maintain throughout your life, the better. So it just then becomes an N equals one experimentation of dialing in those two independent knobs, fat and protein, until you hit the right level for both. Well, really, it's three knobs. It's individual protein, absolute value, individual fat, absolute value, and then kind of a result of both of those is the hysteresis knob, the kind of percentage. I find for most people that 80-20 is often pushing the limit in terms of how much fat. And that's by, that's by way of energy, by the way. Energy. Um once you get much over 80% fat and, and your protein drops below about 20, you're going to get into trouble. In fact, you might even be in trouble at 80, 20 for a lot of people. That's often too high. So um, those, are the, those are the factors I look at. So the first, when someone comes to me and says, I'm having a problem, you know, it's not working well for me, blah, blah, blah. The, the first thing I go to is microbiome. Have they upset the microbiome? Have they just gone carnivore sometime in the last six months? Did they did they hammer over one day and decide to go carnivore the next day instead of doing a proper transition? If it's not that, then I go, right, let's have a look at your macronutrient profile. Let's look at your fat to protein ratio. If they don't know, I, I get them to keep a record, a really good record for two or three weeks and get back to me. If we can talk about it since because they have been recording and they do know, then we say, right, Okay, that looks like too much protein or not enough protein, too much fat, not enough fat, and we just juggle around. And then there's an optimal for each individual person based on where they're at at that time. There's an average best, and that's where I usually start, and then we adjust from there. And what I have found in my practice, in my experience, as an average, as a rule of thumb, the best ratio of fat to protein turns out to be about 66.33 for most people. Plus or minus about 5% either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that matches what I'm seeing online. So I'm in a number of different groups online and some are high protein focused, some are high fat focused. Yeah. 
it seems to me that in the short term at least um the high fat approach is causing problems yeah um they're not getting the desired outcomes they want their blood sugar still isn't regulated yeah and a lot of cases uh, their body composition is getting worse so it seems to be that that's the case and that's just the short term so looking down the line yeah people doing this for, you know 80 percent fat plus for um you know a year or two you could be a completely different person and not a great site to look at no no yeah. all right there you have it brilliant thanks very much for your time bart i appreciate you coming on not at all my absolute pleasure and um yeah i hope to talk to you again soon and um yeah we'll, we'll knock over whatever questions you have then cheers i have plenty more then i'm sure cool bananas see you then